my name is Jules Walker. Uh, a lot of people know me either as Lady Velo or the blogger behind Velo City Girl. I am a blogger, a cycling activist and an author. I wrote my first book, uh, Back in the Frame, which is the story of how I got into cycling and talking about other incredible women in the cycling industry as well who have inspired me. That came out in May 2019. And I've been keeping myself pretty busy with everything cycling, activism, trying to widen the activity, the participation of the activity for, for more women and minority groups out there. And basically just singing the, the wonderful virtues about how great cycling can be. Oh, I love that so much. So let's talk about your cycling and love for cycling. Did that <laughs> did that start in childhood? Were you from like quite a sporty, outdoorsy family? Were you on your bikes from on, from a young age? Well, it did start in childhood, but I didn't come from a particularly sporty family at all. I mean, I have an older brother and an older sister who, as I'll explain, were huge inspirations for me to get into cycling. But it was never in a competitive manner or to take part in any competitions or anything like that at all. It was genuinely just for the love of being on a bike, which is what I'm really about these days. Um I, as I said, I, I grew up with an older brother and an older sister, and it was my sister, Michelle, who is eight years older than me, was the one who was quite into to cycling. So I used to admire her riding around on her rally burner that she had. So she had this gorgeous uh, red, yellow and chrome BMX that she used to ride around on, which was her dream machine. And I always used to think to myself, like, when I'm old enough, I want to be just like her. I want to be riding around on a bike like her with her friends who were all girls as well, just bombing about on their bikes and enjoying themselves. So I had to wait a while for that to, to happen. Obviously, being eight years younger than, than my sister, we weren't exactly playmates. And, you know, she's hanging around with her, her big friends and she probably doesn't want her snotty nosed little sister hanging around with her. But I just I thought she was really cool. And I thought her friends that she hung out with were cool. And when, unfortunately, she fell out of love with cycling and the BMX basically got relegated to the downstairs cupboard and wasn't being uh, ridden, my brother then taught me how to ride that bike. So I had my brother who is 16 years older than me. So there's quite a big age gap between me and my brother and my sister um, teaching me how to ride that bike in the same way that he taught my sister Michelle to ride that bike as well. So yeah, it was um, it was a, a childhood dream to be riding around like her, a childhood dream to have friends who were into to being on their bikes just like she did. And eventually it it happened, which was great. And did you get to ride that BMX bike of your sister's? I did indeed. So she kind of gave me the permission to to ride it because it was in in the cupboard. It wasn't going to get thrown away because. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very upfront about the fact that we weren't a particularly rich family. So for my mum to have taken up, you know, a big chunk of her wages to, to buy that bike at the time was a big deal. So, you know, you, you, you hold on to it. You know, there's the just in case you never know, like Julie might want to ride around on it. And and Julie, because that's what everybody calls me and my family did. So, um, yeah, it got spruced up because it did need some some TLC, even though it was living in the downstairs cupboard and wasn't outside being exposed to the elements and rusting away. It hadn't been ridden for quite some time. So my brother, who just appears to be a dab hand at anything that he turns his mind to, was able to, to do a bit of DIY on it, a bit of bike maintenance and get it going. And he was the one who taught me how to to ride it, which was was great. My brother had um, bikes as well. As I say, he wasn't into to cycling in a competitive sense, but he just enjoyed getting on a bike and having a ride. So I had my older brother to to ride with, which was a lot of fun. And I had my school friends and um, some of the friends of mine who lived on the same council estate as me to go riding with. So it was it was incredibly formative. I, I it's strange to think what an impact that bike when I was like seven years old has had on me now. At 37 years old, I'm still thinking about how 
formative and important that was for me and how that shaped my life. Yeah, I bet it's like, you know, looking back now, I bet you never even imagined like where like the cycling would would take you (laughs) and, you know, how it's become such a huge part of your life. I mean, do you do you remember when you were a little girl, like what your dreams were or what you thought you'd do when you were going to be like an adult or grown up? Goodness. Yeah. And I, I still laugh about it to this day because it's it's nowhere near what I thought I was going to to be. I mean, when I was a, a kid on my bike, that was that. It was joy. It was fun. It was hanging around my friends. I never in a million years would have imagined that all this way down the line, it's now pretty much my life. But when I was younger, um, I was going to become a barrister. That was my plan. I wanted to be a, a barrister. So. <laughs> um, that the inspiration from that actually came from a cousin of mine in Birmingham and uh, she she's a barrister and it was a huge deal that she'd studied gone on to university studied law did the bar everything and then became a barrister and I was just like I'm gonna be that that's that's gonna be me and to the point that I did study law at university as well and it just never happened. Like it, it's really bizarre to think that my my degree that I ended up doing, and what I thought I wanted to be, has nothing to do with the career path that I ended up going down. And that was the the beauty of the the journey, quite metaphorically and physically, that cycling has taken me on. Yeah, I, I believe you almost took um, a little bit of a break from cycling, and then you you took it back up again at twenty eight. Um, yeah. What, what happened during that period? Was it just sort of that? you just sort of fell out of not love with cycling but I suppose you not grow up as well but yeah, no, I, I, I get what you mean it was it was I hate to say it was one of those things because it was a combination of many things that that took me out of of cycling so there's the classic thing that you hear so many girls and young women talking about where their friends don't cycle anymore. It's not seen as cool. Everybody wants to learn how to drive. As soon as you hit 17, you want to get your provisional license and, you know, get yourself in a car. Things just kind of drifted away at that point. So for me, some of the factors as to why I stopped cycling when I was was 18, when I I came off of a bike, you know, I, I did grow apart from friends of mine, like my cycling crew that I used to ride around with when I was a child, uh, partly because some of them moved out of the area. Um, you get into to different things. There are different interests that come along. There was the element of starting to feel quite lonely with it, too, because it's quite a change to have a, a group of friends that you would ride with to suddenly being on your own like they're not interested in it anymore they're not around there's also the other element of becoming a lot more conscious and hyper aware of what it was like being on a bike as a teenage girl which is a depressing thing to to happen but you know things like catcalling would happen to me quite often when I would be out cycling and especially when I was in my school uniform which was incredibly creepy and vile and it was at the point where if I was going to be cycling home from, from school, I wouldn't feel comfortable enough to cycle home in my uniform just in case some, you know, lecherous dude said something to me. So I would get changed and, you know, there, there would be no need for me to, to change my routine and what it is that I do for fear of somebody harassing me on my way home from school. So that's a a huge element that that played into it. And then there was the element of actually not feeling that safe and confident cycling in London on on busy London roads and in traffic anymore. It's not to say that I was completely carefree and wasn't aware of that as a, a child. But when you're getting a bit older and you're doing, you know, commutes to school or you're going to attempt to commute to college or something like that, you're doing a different style of, of cycling. You're in amongst busy rush hour traffic in the mornings and that might not feel that that great anymore. I didn't go to a, a local secondary school to me. It was still in my borough, but it was much further away than just being able to go around the corner in in five, five, 10 minutes to get to school. It was about, say, 35 minute journey. And that would be me cycling from where I am in East London to to Stratford, where my secondary school was. And it wasn't a particularly fun cycling route to, to take as well. So things like that played into 
me suddenly feeling like this this isn't what I want to be doing anymore and then I would find excuses to, to to justify why I had been sort of forced off of my bike so you know oh I can just get the the, the bus straight to, to, to school that's fine or if I you know when it came to going to college there was another bus that took me straight to Walthamstow to get me to sixth form when it came to going to university I stayed in London for uni, I could get the the DLR, the Docklands Light Railway, straight to the campus at Greenwich. So there was always an excuse for me to, to make myself feel better for not being on a bike, even though I ended up desperately missing it and spent 10 years thinking to myself, I want to be doing this again, because it was something that made me so happy. Yeah, it's almost like this, this transition period, like almost like, as we go through our life cycle, it's almost the same with like the bike as well. So when you're, you know, you're young, it's almost like your first sense of freedom, but Mm. you know, maybe it's like cycling around the garden or cycling around the park or cycling Mm -hmm. around, you know, your road, you're not really going anywhere. You're just sort of cycling. And then it evolves to suddenly going from A to B from commuting. And then that's, that's such a completely different dynamic. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you got back in, you you rediscovered cycling um, after this 10 year absence. What happened there? How did you rediscover it? So I stopped at 18. And then I'd spent, like I said, 10 years just sort of umming and ahhing about what I missed about cycling, how much I enjoyed it, how I would love to get my ultimate dream bike after the the BMX that I had. And at at 28 years old, lots of different factors came into play. Um, I had met my wonderful boyfriend, Ian, who I've been with for for 15 years now. Um, And he was really into cycling. It was one of the things that, that got me again. It's not necessarily competitive cycling he just really enjoys being on a bike and at the the time he was living in South Sea and he would uh, cycle to to work from his place to the offices that he worked at but his route would involve cycling along the seafront and I thought to myself like what an amazing way to to get to work how lovely that is to to do that because you know my my version of getting into work was getting on a, a crowded train and feeling exhausted by the time I got into my desk because the commute had already taken it out of me. Um, I'm someone who actually uh, suffers from panic attacks as well. So being on a train and just being crowded in by people is not good for, for me as well. And I was just like, I, I don't want to feel like this anymore. And I knew being back on a bike was something that would take me out of that. And the commute to the the place I was working at the time, I was working as an admissions officer at the University of East London, would have been a lovely cycle route. So that was something that was preying on my mind as well. Then, as I said, thinking about the freedom and the joy that I used to get out of cycling, but then also thinking about the fact that one of the factors that had kept me off of a bike for that 10-year that hiatus that I had was feeling like cycling wasn't necessarily a place or a space for somebody who looks like me. So I'd, I'd dip in and look at what was going on like in cycling, just in the sense of the advertising, the marketing that surrounded it, how it was being you know, fed to you by the cycling media. And every time I would look at that and think, right, I'm, I'm going to look at this for encouragement. I'm going to look at this as a stepping stone to say, yep, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take inspiration from it. It was great to see how wonderful cycling is and how wonderful it could be. But it was also really disappointing to see the lack of diversity that was being presented in cycling media and cycling advertising as well. And maybe some people will think, oh, you're thinking too hard about it. If you just want to get into it, why don't you just do it? I always say this, if you can't see it, how are you expected to feel like you can be it? And advertising and the images that are put out there play a huge part in actually feeling like the doors are open and that this is a welcoming space for you to be in. And then I thought to myself, well, if I'm not seeing it and I want to be it, perhaps I could just be it myself. And maybe if I'm putting myself out there, if there's anybody else out there, like any young black women who are feeling the same way as me, perhaps this will be a gateway for them to think I can do this too. So for me, it was the normalization of seeing black women and 
other women out there who could identify with somebody like me to be in this space. So I kind of took a, a, for me, it was a risk because I didn't know if it was going to be met with some kind of a backlash or if there were going to be people who were like, why on earth is she doing this? But if I fed into to, to that noise, then I probably would have never got the, the, the gumption to just be like, right, I'm, I'm just going to put myself out there and do it. And it was one of the best decisions that I made. It can, can sometimes be tricky navigating your way around that space, but I'm so glad that I did it because of what's happened within now the 10 years that I've been back on a bike for. Absolutely. And it is so important because I think, like I remember when I lived in London, I thought the only cyclists were basically white men in their 40s who were like, oh, I've got to try and lose some weight and they'll buy some Lycra and they had the, mm. the, you know, the, the best bikes that they could have. And it was <laughs> maybe like very competitive when you get to the traffic light and, you know, what's mm. everyone wearing, what are people's bikes. And, and I think it can be really intimidating to almost put yourself in that space and I think London's almost like a completely different kettle of fish just just because of the the traffic and and the noise and like the city and um, yeah it's quite I, I've um I did I never cycle commuted I would maybe I did have a bike in London but would just never really go that far literally I'd cycle to a friend's house and occasionally I'd go you know I'd go on the pavement just because I didn't have that confidence Mm -hmm. how have you found that your confidence has changed since you started cycling and started you know putting yourself out there into that space well, there's the element, just what you were talking about with um, commuting in London as well. It, I'm not going to lie, it can get quite hairy and it's not a city that is necessarily designed for people on bikes. So <laughs> some work is being done to the infrastructure in, in London for, for people who want to ride bikes. But there's still a long way to go. And, you know, at the beginning of my cycling journey 10 years ago, I was super excited because the um, they're called um, just the cycleways now. But the CS3, Cycle Superhighway, is pretty much on my doorstep. Like the start of it is at the, the beginning it's where I live in, in East London. And I was thrilled about it being there because I thought okay cool I'm, I'm getting into this I've actually got this this cycle route that I could follow to a certain point and then when I get to Tower Gateway where it ends if I'm able to navigate my way around the rest of the city then you know happy days but it was a lick of blue paint on on the pavement it wasn't like a, a particularly segregated cycle lane there were parts of the CS3 where you get to um, sort of Poplar and Blackwall where it actually just stops and you have to look for the blue squares that have been painted along a road. So it's a main road that you're sharing with with cars anyway. And it's stuff like that that even to this day still makes me think this this isn't a particularly user friendly I- experience. And especially if you're someone who can be, you know, put off by riding in busy traffic, which is completely understandable and trying to navigate your way through that is it's scary. It can be really scary. And for me, that was one of the things that did put me off of, of cycling as I got older, just being more aware of it not being fit for purpose to a certain extent. Um, and it's it's taken a while for me to build up my confidence to, to be on a bike because I still have my moments and I'm super honest about it, that if I still don't feel comfortable riding on the road, I will get off my bike and get onto the pavement and walk until I feel like I'm at a point where I can rejoin the traffic again. There's nothing wrong with doing that because if it's comfortable for you and makes you feel safe, then that's good. What is wrong with that is the fact that you're even having to do it because that infrastructure doesn't exist for you to to cycle or feel confident and safe enough to do so. So it's been and continues to be a a learning process for me in regards to my confidence being shaken in that sense of physically being out on the road. Then the other side of what you were talking about, the confidence to, I don't know, maybe put myself out there and be seen and be very vocal about trying to widen participation in cycling, trying to make cycling a space that's more diverse and more welcoming. That, that, can be pretty hairy as well, especially when you get some of the the kickbacks and some of the abuse that I've experienced over 10 years for that too. But there's this funny element of living 
in a city like London, where you would think of it as being one of the most multiculturally diverse places on on the planet, but you don't see that necessarily in cycling. It's it's a very strange thing to try and and balance in in your head and just trying to to work out how somewhere so diverse and so multicultural doesn't have that reflected in an activity like like cycling. There is a whole other conversation about the factors that will will play into that as well. But when you're not seeing black and indigenous people of color riding bikes in in the city like this it's just like okay maybe maybe something is is quite wrong here something definitely needs to change and especially where I've ended up working in the cycling industry and you suddenly discover that there are still elements of it that are very old school and very set in their ways and very blinkered sometimes you can get shot down for for daring to open your mouth and and say something and that just makes you think I've had moments where I'm like why am I why am I bothering to do this why am I actually putting myself out here with this when all I'm getting is grief and exhaustion and feeling like I'm banging my head against a brick wall but I have to find it in myself to to keep on going and to keep on doing this it's conversations that need to be had it's changes that still need to be made and the only way that you're going to shake up the status quo for something like that is to be vocal about it and to make sure that action happens yeah and and you were driving that change, you know, by putting yourself out there, by starting your blog as well, by sharing, <laughs> you know, by sharing your journey. Tell us more about your your blog, Velo City Girl. Like, yeah, so I'd, I'd started Velo City Girl. Like, it was actually just before I got the bike. I I started it off because I I wanted to sort of feel the ground put everything that I could of myself out there and just sort of test the water, I guess. So I did that. And other than it being, uh, I realise now, obviously, it was a form of activism doing that also. It was a way for me to to meet up with other people in the cycling community who were incredibly welcoming. And this is why I refer to anyone that I have become connected with in cycling as part of my cycling family, because that's what it felt like. Like, you know, when I did my first blog post on Velo City Girl, and I think I got something like 15 comments or something, which I guess is is small fry to some people. I mean, that's huge. (laughs) That was massive. I was like, there are at least 15 people who read this and wanted to say hello and welcome. And we can't wait to see your bike. And we hope that you really enjoy getting back into cycling again. I was like, yeah this this felt good it was it was such a positive reaction to get and I was like you know I knew it wasn't going to be all unicorns and rainbows but I just thought this is going to be great it's going to be wonderful so you know I started that off and the the other element with with Velo City Girl was definitely the cycle style element of it because I am very much what you see is what you get of me on a bike so I will cycle in my normal everyday clothes. I used to get very frustrated when I was telling people initially, you know, I'm going to gonna get myself back on a bike. I'm going to start riding again. And it was this whole, well, you'll need this helmet. You will need this jacket. You will need these clips to go around the bottom of your trousers when you're riding. You've got to make sure that you've got all of your high beers. You won't be able to cycle in the jeans or the dresses and the skirts that you normally are in. And I'm like... Yes, I can. I'm, I'm not sure why you're telling me that I actually have to change my whole person in order to get back on a bike. And I kind of wanted to, to, to show people it is possible to, to, to do this. There's nothing alien about cycling in your normal everyday clothes. And fashion and style is a huge part of, of who I am. I express myself through my clothing. I express myself through things like my very loud jewellery and very loud sort of almost obnoxiously loud glasses that I wear as well, because that's all all part of me. And it was just the the fun element of, of that, too. I like being quite a loud, bright person. And it maybe tells you something about what I'm like when I get very vocal talking about things in cycling as well. And, you know, the, the style element of it was was great because there were other blogs out there obviously people will know about like Copenhagen cycles chic and 
those kind of blogs that exist that just show people in their everyday clothes or looking very chic cycling on their bikes and I was like yeah this is this is something I feel like I can relate to and I want more people to to see that side of it as well and not believe that in order to to get on a bike you have to be head to toe in lycra you cannot wear anything else but this this like you know tight gripping spandex against your body and you know i i now have lycra in in my wardrobe because things change things happen different types of cycling have have come along so i can understand the need for for having the bib shorts and things like that but that's not the only way that you you have to be to to do it so there was the element of the normalization of cycling is just an everyday thing that I really wanted to get across with Velo City Girl and also just charting my journey in into the world of of, of bikes just the the highs and the lows being honest about the days when it felt great honest about the days when it didn't feel so great being on a bike as well um it was just a sort of everyday cycling blog is what I wanted to to create with Velo City Girl and something that hopefully lots of people could identify with and enjoy reading and just think yeah actually that's that sounds all right I might give that a go yeah I mean you while you were building up your your blog you you know you're still working a full-time job did Mm. you have dreams about where you could take it or what you wanted to do with it was was there something in you which you thought you know hold on maybe I could make this a full-time career was that was that any of the like the motivation in all honesty no not at all. I, I still to this day refer to Velo City Girl as my tiny corner of the internet because it was just a space that I made for myself that I could zone into. Um, it was a, a, a passion, a, a hobby, something that I enjoyed and still did. And there was never any intention for me to be like, how can I monetize this? How can I turn this into something that's going to to pay my bills and make me happy at the same time? I was like, no, I... I have a full time job. Um, it's it's all right. It might not be necessarily exactly what I wanted to to be doing, but I I kind of fell into a, a funk just to to go back a few steps when I finished university, and I kind of didn't know what I wanted to to do. It's that that weird thing of I went on to to uni. I did um, politics with law was the degree that I ended up doing because I did end up changing my mind about studying law when I was doing my A-levels and then I decided because I did my A-levels I did were government and politics English language and law and I enjoyed the government and politics and I enjoyed the law and I was like if I could do that as a combined honours degree perhaps that would be enjoyable I don't know what I'm going to do at the end of it but at least I will enjoy what I'm studying I did that I graduated and then I was like what do I do now? Because I don't actually want to to have a career in either of these fields. Maybe I can force myself into doing something along those lines because there are bills to be paid. But I I was in a in a funk, and I ended up during um, like time off that I had. So so post university, I I did something which maybe was a bit frivolous, but I had some money left over from from savings um, because I was doing part-time work while I was at university and was able to squirrel some money away. Um, I went to Trinidad with my mum, which is where my mother is originally from. And we went out there for a month and we just we stayed in Trinidad in the, the family home that we have out there and just chilled out. And for me, that was probably to this day the most luxurious thing that I've ever done because I probably couldn't afford to do that again but I went out there to try and get my head together um to to chill out after an intense three years of of studying and just trying to figure out what on earth I was going to do at the end of my degree because the panic was there I I knew I was coming up to the end of my degree and I still didn't know what I wanted to do um and I came back from Trinidad I saw that the University of East London were looking for staff to work in their clearing and enrolment centre within their admissions team. While I studied at the University of Greenwich, a part time job that I had was actually at the the university itself because they I I don't know if universities still do this, but they they had something called the work bank. And it was for students at the university could get like admin jobs or what have you within the, the university campus. 
And I worked um, in the admissions team in the international office at the University of Greenwich. And I thought when I saw that job advert for, for UEL, I was like, I can do that. It's just something that will will, will pay the, the bills. I can apply to UEL and see if they'll, they'll take me on. I ended up working in the clearing and enrollment center. And then I got offered a full time job in their admissions office at the end of it instead of them like getting rid of my, my temporary contract. And that somehow turned into me being there for seven years that that was never the plan but it paid well it was incredibly close to home um in amongst all of that was how I was actually able to get uh Frankie my Pashley as well because I got it through the cycle to work scheme at the University of East London and I was like this is this is this is perfect everything's kind of set in that sense it's all working out there did come the point where I did become unhappy at UEL because it was just that classic panic all over again of this isn't what I wanted to do it's not a bad job but it isn't what I see myself doing for the rest of my life but I didn't know what it was that I wanted to be doing and then an opportunity actually came up via the blog to start working in the cycling industry and that kind of felt like a a dream come true but yeah, it was it was never the intention for 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 that to happen. Velo City Girl was never designed to be a springboard for for cycling and the cycling industry to be my career path that I'm now on. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Like, just even you know, you're talking about you know being at university and almost that mm. that str- it is stressful. Like, I think <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to say what do you want to do with the rest of your life and yeah. I just, How- how do you answer a question like that? Because I'm even like I'm looking at my my nephews, for for example, they're, they're they're teenage boys, and you know they're in secondary school, and I'm like panicking on their behalf, actually thinking to myself, how do you make that that decision? How how do you know like a you know 15 years old? I'm definitely going to be doing this when I am. 35 years old or 45 years old. This is going to be me. You you don't. No. And it's just it's huge pressure. I I thought I knew that. I thought when I was a child, I knew I was going to become a a barrister and nothing was going to stop me. It was the dream. It was the goal. And then when I got to that point of being old enough when I'm at college and university and just thinking this, this isn't what I want to do. But because I had my heart set on being one thing, I didn't look at anything else. I didn't consider anything else. And then you're, you're just in a really sticky place with that. So it's it's kind of insane to 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 think when I was a child I, I thought I had it all mapped out I had no clue I had absolutely no clue but yeah it was um it was incredible what what happened with with Velo City Guard and how that did end up being the start of a whole new journey and then it it taking me to the places that I've been to and what it is that I'm doing now. But it's it's still, to me, it's still very funny to, to think that's where this all started. That's where this all came from. And that was never, ever the plan. How have you found it turning, you know, a hobby, something that you do for fun and for passion and for enjoyment into into a into a job having to earn an income from it you know being able to fund your lifestyle through the work that you're doing how have you found mm-hmm. that transition it was it started off as i said like a, a a dream because i ended up you know doing something that combined two of my loves which was cycling and fashion by working for a cycling clothing company and that was like okay this is this is unbelievable this is great again it wasn't all going to be as i say unicorns and and rainbows but it was still very exciting and then when you have those moments where your your hobby and the thing that brings you so much joy isn't bringing you joy and can actually be quite difficult to to deal with it becomes very hard because it's now the thing that everybody knows you for this is this is lady velo this is what jules does and when you start to fall out of love with something that brings you joy and you can't say that out loud it feels really difficult there's the the fear that 
something that you you love starts to feel like a bit of a I don't know if the terms if it's a is it albatross I don't know but it's just when something just feels like it's very heavy and yeah. it, it's 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 like oh no like I, I I don't I don't want to fall out of love with this thing that brings me so much joy and I don't want my my hobby and my little corner of the internet and my little ray of sunshine to be something that that I hate because you know you could have the ultimate dream job and I find it very hard to believe that nobody has a terrible day doing what they love there's there's absolutely no way that you're not going to have a bad day at work so you know when you hear people coming out with phrases like you know you know, do the thing that you love. And if that's your job, you will never have a bad, bad day at work. You will never have a terrible time at work. And it's like, yes, you you still can. And that can be a really tricky thing to sort of like pull yourself out of. So the transition has been wild at times. It's been eye-opening with certain elements of it. Um, and it's been it's been surprising where the, the the transition into to cycling being my main form of income has taken me so for instance the idea of doing what I, I i started up 10 years ago and then writing a book you know i i, I dreamt of of doing things like that it's it's the the cliche of like oh you know i would love to write a book i really enjoy writing you know when i'd like when i studied English language at uh, A level. Um, one of the things I kind of regretted is that I didn't I didn't think about doing that as a degree because I probably would have thrown myself into it and loved it. I was that kid who loved writing short stories and then presenting them to my parents and reading to them. I was that kid at school that that sort of really enjoyed that those elements of literature and and language and. I was like, I, I didn't take that very, very far. I didn't take it as far as I could have done because I was going to be a barrister. That that was the thing. That's there's nothing else to think about. I'm going to be doing that. So for that opportunity to to come up to to write back in the frame was incredible. Um, it was also an education of how I knew that writing a book was going to be very, very hard. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. And the whole process of back in the frame from start to finish actually took near on three years to to do that um and I I just never expected that that would be something I would ever end up doing both in cycling and just just in in life because if I'd listened to the words of my careers advisor which is something that I talk about in in the book um girls like me aren't supposed to do things like this 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 isn't our career path this isn't what we do so yeah it's um it, it's been wild it's probably the best way to describe it is that it's been very very wild but it's it's been something that I've needed to 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 navigate my way through as well that this this is work this is this is who I am the the hobby is now the income but not to ever lose sight of the fact that this is something that makes me happy. That's why I, I really have to keep in the front of my mind that being on a bike and cycling is something that makes me happy. And, you know, it's a blessing that it's something that I actually do now for, for a living, but it's making sure that I maintain that balance and not having it be something that I, I fall out of love with in a big way again. Yeah. I mean, your book, Back in the Frame, How to Get Back on Your Bike, Whatever Life Throws at You, you, you actually share a lot of personal stuff in the book about you know dealing with depression and then in your early 30s being hit by you know a, a mini stroke mm. how <laughs> how was it sort of sharing that side of yourself and you know putting putting that out there it was hard but it was also really cathartic as well um I don't know maybe maybe the time that I spent writing the book was like three years of, of therapy getting this stuff out but I I had a feeling that I would end up talking about like some of the the more personal and and deeper stuff because if anyone out there follows me on social media or reads fellow city girl you'll know that I'll talk about the lows as well as talking about the highs and it's for me it's really important to do that it 
it was something that I became more comfortable with doing. Um, not necessarily in the sense of like I'm an, an oversharer because it, it still amuses people when I say this, that I can be quite introverted and I can be quite a private person, but there are some things that I I do talk about and I'm okay with talking about them, like talking about the, you know, living with depression, uh, living with a, a parent who lives with depression as well, talking about stuff like my parents' breakup, um, experiencing grief for the very first time and understanding what that was when I lost my grandmother when I was like 16. It was, it was all these things that have all obviously played a part of, of forming me into the person that I am and I'm still, you know, developing into just because I'm 37 years old doesn't mean that I'm not still learning about myself and, and growing. But all of this was tied up in in why I got into to, to cycling, what I used to get out of cycling, what cycling used to take me out of as well. Some of the situations that I was in uh, mentally that not necessarily that it was an escape, but it was something else to, to occupy me and something else to give me sort of peace of mind and mindfulness. So talking about that in the book and having an incredible editor to work with as well on, on this and, and shaping it and crafting it into something that made sense and that I felt comfortable sharing was important too. Because, you know, if it was just a case of someone saying to me, we need something a bit sensational in the book. We need you to put something in there juicy that's going to be a great hook for the readers. That ain't it. That isn't how it's going going to be. And, you know, Rhiannon, my editor that I, I worked with on Back in the Frame, she was, again, it's probably going to sound quite deep, but she was opening up parts of my, my mind and things that I didn't think were related to, to anything at all and making me realise that they were. And actually being able to, to to craft it into the whole narrative of, of back in the frame, it actually helped me make sense of a lot of stuff that I was still processing. Like, you know, either memories and thoughts that I had, had buried because it was easier to, to bury it away and not deal with it. And being able to talk about, you know, being honest and, and upfront about living with, with depression and other things that have affected me was cathartic and and necessary but the biggest thing the biggest takeaway that's come out of that is other people out there who have read back in the frame and have been either surprised that it isn't a book that's literally just about bikes and and riding and bike mechanics and things like that and actually finding bits in that book that they could relate to on a completely different level and then contacting me and telling me that somehow what I've said or what I've talked about has helped them through something, helped them deal through stuff that they may have, you know, buried and didn't want to, to, to deal with because it was too emotionally draining to, to, to try. And that has made me realise that sharing some of the stuff that I have, both in that book and over the years on, on social media, has sparked off conversations that have helped other people that that was an important thing to, to do and an important thing to keep on doing. You know, obviously I don't have to share absolutely everything about myself on online, but never underestimate the power of, 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 of talking to, to somebody or, you know, telling somebody how you feel. And for me, putting pen to paper or, you know, tapping it away on, on the keyboard to the screen made a, a huge difference. So, you know, I've, I've, talked about the fact that I'm an eternal eternal journal keeper I have a box of diaries that I started when I was about 10 11 years old that I've hung on to it's quite funny to read back through some of the stuff that I'd written about but for me writing things down is like a, a form of therapy and that was something that came out of writing back in the frame as well which will always mean mean a lot to me and it it means more to know that it's helped other people out there too. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think um, even going back t maybe even like 20 years ago, there was almost like this taboo around mental health or, you know, mm. it, it 
just because you couldn't you couldn't see it it's not like having like a physical injury like people couldn't understand yeah the, you, the, the challenges with mental health and I think I mean I, it could just this could just be my personal view but I've definitely noticed over the past couple of years just people being willing to talk more about their own struggles and, and challenges and you know what what they face and how they've made it work for them whether mm. it's you know medication or running or cycling or whatever it is mm-hmm. and, but it's doing it in such a way that it's not like it's not telling people this is what you've got to do it's just saying look yeah you you yeah. are you are not alone exactly and it's been so encouraging and heartwarming to see that the the conversations around uh, mental health are a lot more open um from you know talking about mental health especially in um the afro caribbean community as well it's it's a, a taboo like for for instance the fact that i talked about you know um my mother and her living with depression, I definitely like, you know, got permission from my mum to to talk about that because she may not have felt comfortable with me putting that in in the book. But even amongst our own communities, it can still be quite the taboo to talk about about these things. And, you know, to go off on on a bit of a tangent, I actually did uh, a newsletter this this week so I have this newsletter called fellow mail that I send out and it's a place where I talk about the stuff that isn't necessarily about about cycling that wouldn't sit on on Velo city girl but I have an outlet that I can write this stuff down and, and send out to, to folks if they want to read it or not and one of the things that I talked about in there was the the trope of the the strong black woman that we're we're resolute we're strong we're resilient, nothing can grind us down. And even that is is exhausting in itself, because if you're anything other than those things as a black woman, then you're you're weak. You're you're not strong. This isn't how we are. This isn't how we're built. This isn't how we're designed. And it's like, why are we being forced to live up to this trope and this standard that's been put out there when you know, when I've had abuse flung at me, which I've had my fair share of over the years on the internet, and weirdly enough, even more so over the last few years with the particular things that have been going on in in the media and in current affairs, I get tired of the fact that people seem to think that that doesn't affect you, or it doesn't grind you down, and, and it does. And I'd I'd said in the newsletter that to be anything other than this trope that's put out there. So if you're feeling weak or vulnerable or angry or scared, it's almost like a luxury to be able to to say that as a a black woman, that that's how, how you're feeling because that's not, that's not how we are. So when it comes to the discussions around mental health and especially for me within the the black community I find it really important to break down those taboos that that surround it so you know you have excellent resources out there now that that are appearing that are so needed like there's the the black minds matter organization that's you know a, a charity specifically for 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 black people who have had trauma, who have gone through mental health issues and having that safe space to be able to seek help is important. You see it on the other end of the the scale with discussions around mental health. So there are lots of men's mental health charities and organisations that are appearing now as well. That's incredibly important to, to, to see that happening because, you know, men will have that trope that it's not particularly masculine to cry or to talk about your feelings or if if something is wrong you it's like the term you man up you deal with it i i i can't stand that stuff i really can't because it is so damaging because you're just internalizing all of this stuff that's going on and at some point you will implode and you know that's again something that i talked about in the book when i had a breakdown <laughs> And it's like, I'm laughing about it. I know it's not funny, but it's just the idea of having to sit on your emotions and having to sit on feeling like crap and not feeling like you could talk about it or express it. And then it goes horribly wrong. I witnessed that happen 
to my mother when I was younger. And then history repeated itself with me when I was in my 20s. The same thing happened to me too. So this is why all of these conversations really need to be, be had. The stigma that still surrounds mental health may never be completely broken down, but work is being done to, towards it. And, you know, as I say with, with cycling, I love it. I will never, ever prescribe it as a cure-all and a, a fix to whatever it is that's going wrong in your, your life because, you know, your, your mental health is a very individual thing. What works for me will not necessarily work for the next person. You know, what works for the next person will not necessarily work for me. So I will, I will never tell you, get on your bike and ride out all of your problems. It's, it's going to be absolutely fine. All you need to do is get out three times a week, ride this distance. This will be great. When I'm someone who has been very frank about the fact that I have difficulty getting out of bed sometimes and the idea of getting on a bike is the last thing that I want to do. Why on earth would I try to ram it down somebody's throat that this is the thing that's going to, 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 to save you and make everything better? It's, it's what works for the individual. And cycling has helped me along the way. It hasn't fixed everything, but it is a huge help for me. And, and that's, how, that's how it's going to be. That's how I'm going to be honest about it and just say that, you know, it's, it's there when, when I need it. And I also understand not to be hard on myself when cycling is the last thing that I want to do. And that's okay as well yeah absolutely absolutely and um, we've spoken to a lot of cyclists um over over the years <laughs> and one of the things that they seem to have in common is that they seem to name their bikes so i'd love to know and this is uh, you know how many, what one how many bikes do you have and two are they what are their names and what's uh, the reason behind their names <laughs> there, there, there are a lot there are a lot of bikes in the house um, partly now because, <laughs> because me and Ian uh, are, are, are living together at last. So like I said, we've been together for, for 15 years, um, but we only started living together last year when he moved back to, to London. And so him moving back to London meant all of his bikes would have to move back to London as well. So we have basically had to compromise on space around the, the house. Um, I'm 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 gonna have to do like a very sort of childish headcount. <laughs> it's not like I've got a hundred bikes in my house, but things happen and bikes just suddenly like appear. So where I am right now in my bedroom slash office, there are three bikes at the bottom of the bed. So uh, they're all they're all Ian's. Well, it's two and a half bikes really. His Cannondale is here. His beta bike, which is a very nice old rally that he like added bits and pieces to, is it's the joke of it being, I don't know, you know the term beta bike that it's just your 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 your, your get about bike. If something happens to it, it's no big deal because it's a fifty quid bike. If it gets stolen, it gets stolen. But it's one of those bikes that has had various components added to it. So if it gets stolen, it's now going to be terrible if it goes. And then the the half a bike that's at the bottom of the bed um, is a Paris frame. So this is Ian's passion project. That it's a frame that was uh, built in 1948, and he is at the moment sourcing vintage parts for it to to turn it into a very nice single speed bike to ride around on. So there's those bikes in the spare bedroom. There is my Color Bolt, which is my single speed uh, bike that is called Ratty. Um, so that's her name. There is my original road bike, my Priya, which is called Bad Gal, because she makes me feel quite fierce when I'm riding around on her. Yes. And there is also Ian's EG Bait. So that's his very old, beautiful, but his proper sort of take it out on a Sunday, polish it give it a clean, make sure it's all gleaming bike that he absolutely loves. So he's EG Bates, which I love that bike as well. Um, so, so it was built in 1982. So the bike is as old as me. And the wonderful thing about EG Bates, there's a whole history behind the Bates brothers who used to build these bikes. And um, their original shop was actually um, on the Barking Road, which is not very far from where I live. So there was something very lovely about Ian finding his dream vintage bike that was built the year that I was born 
and was built probably about 10, 15 minutes away from my house. So that's a, a, a lovely thing there. So those are those three bikes. The EG Bates doesn't have a name as far as I'm aware. I would have to double check that. I don't think it has a name. Then in the downstairs cupboard, we have uh, Frankie. So that's that's my Pashley. Um, the reason I called her Frankie, because I just like the name, but affectionately she's known as Frank the Tank because she's basically my pack horse of, of a bike. So I love Pashley bikes. They're amazing. They are definitely sturdy and built to last because I think it weighs 18, 18 and a half kilograms. So it's quite a weighty bike, but it, it's that's my bike if I'm going out grocery shopping that I can stick stuff in the basket. I've got the double pannier rack on the back so I can throw as many things as possible into it. So she can carry everything i love her and you know she she was the bike of my dreams that i um that i i wanted to get after the the bmx after getting the burner so that's a joy and then there's the bromptons so ian has a a, a brompton and he then got me a brompton a couple of christmases ago which was a, a very lovely present to, to have and he got it in my favorite color which is a metallic purple so the Brompton is called Paisley, um, as in Prince, because I absolutely love Prince as well. So Purple Rain, that whole thing going on. So that's Paisley. And I think that's that's it. I'm currently in possession of another road bike as well. Um, I have a, a Canyon Endurace, which I'm, I'm very much enjoying both training on indoors on a turbo trainer and and riding outdoors as well. So, yeah, the, I haven't given that one a, a, a name. Yet. <laughs> it may, <laughs> yes, it may well happen, but I haven't given it a name yet. But, yeah, so there's just each of my bikes that I have, they have their own personality. I know it's, you know, an inanimate object, but it's – it's something that brings me joy. And every time I'm on one of those bikes, I feel like a different person. It's a a different Jules. It's a different lady Velo on each of those bikes. And I, I love that about them. I love that if there are days where I want to be racy or, you know, fast or just do something where I'm pushing myself to the limit a little bit more than I usually would, then you know, my road bike like Bad Gal would be the bike that I would be be out on. If it's something like a bit of a, a poodle around town or if I'm doing something like the the Tweed Run, which is an event I used to love taking part in, it would be be Frankie. It would be the Pashley that would come out for that. This beautiful, romantic sit up and beg bicycle is is the one. You know, if I'm zipping about the the the, the city, if I just need to get somewhere like quickly from A to B, but not necessarily doing that on a road bike, I have my single speed or I have my Brompton, which is the bike I'm spending a lot of time on at the moment as well, to, to go to. So they all have names, they all have personalities, they all bring something different out in me. And I just I don't know, I just think it's really joyous that each of them feels like their own person. I guess like each of those bikes has its own personality and makes me feel a particular way when I'm on them. So I think it's great. Everyone who owns a bike should definitely give their bike a name and see the difference that it makes. <laughs> I just have interest. Do you still have your original BMX bike as well? The You know, the one for when you were a child? No. And it's such a regret to this day that we don't have it. Um, you know, by when my sister stopped riding it, she didn't throw it away because there was there was the chance, or rather, my parents didn't throw it away because there was the chance that perhaps someone in the family, i.e., me, might want to ride it. And um, it's it's still a regret to this day that when I fell out of love with with cycling and that bike gated to the downstairs cupboard, it stayed there and it was taking up space. Um, There was nobody else in in the family of an age who was going to take it. So I didn't have, you know, younger cousins that were born within a a, a time that it could have been passed down to. So everyone in my family is very much about spacing out, having having their children. Like I said, my mum spaced us all out (laughs) by eight years. So other aunts and uncles are the same with having having their kids. And it's like, well, it's taking up space nobody is riding it I was like 
off it I was like both physically and mentally I'm I'm not getting on this 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 bike again anytime soon and unfortunately it got dismantled and taken down to the shoot room and that was that it was gone and um I just think to myself just for the nostalgia it would have been amazing to have kept it it would have been amazing if some of the the things that I'm aware of, like some of the bike co-ops that exist now and, you know, charities out there that refurbish old bikes and pass them on to, to people that, that need them. Even if I was aware of stuff like that back then, if I hadn't have kept the bike for myself, it could have been repurposed and given to somebody else to ride because that was a bike that belonged to my sister. It got refurbished and, you know, love was put into it and it sparked off a fire in me that I still carry to this day. And yeah, it's it's a regret that I wasn't able to do that with with the bike. So maybe some of the activism and stuff that I do with Velo City Girl is almost like compensating for the fact that I didn't have a bike to pass on <laughs> to, to, to somebody. So there's 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 many, many layers to this, but it's like, my goodness, I, I really wish that I still had it. But there's somebody um I have to find their name, but someone that I'm following on uh, Instagram at the moment who actually has a rally burner that looks incredibly similar to my one. And they were doing it as a, a refurb. So they, they got hold of it. And I was like, if they are selling this, I want to buy it. I have no room for more bikes in my house. <laughs> I want to buy it. But it's actually a personal um project for them that they're doing. So it's like, it's their bike. But I I saw the the picture of the before and then the after picture turned up on Instagram this week. And I'm just like, it's, it's a beauty. It just reminds me of how much I love that bike and how much I wish I still had it. But, but yeah, if, if, if I could have it uh, again, I would love to I'd absolutely love to. Yeah. So you do actually share a lot of your life on social media and um, you've got the, the blog and the newsletter as well. But where's the best place for people to go to keep updated with your passion for cycling? Oh, my goodness. Um, probably Instagram. It, weirdly enough, like I still I still do blogging on on Velo City Girl but it's almost like Instagram seems to be the place that's like a micro blog these days to do stuff and I've met so many people through Instagram because I'm just so active on there as well but you know I, I pop stuff up on 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 Twitter and Instagram so it's the same handle it's just Lady Velo if you search for that on Instagram Facebook and Twitter I was lucky enough to be able to have the same handle for all of them but yeah, definitely on there. And I think it's because of the um, the very visual element of Instagram is something that I I love. I mean, I know the, the blog is pretty visual as well, but it's just that instant hit of being able to to, to see or listen as well to, to, to stories on like um, Instagram stories or IGTV, things like that. There's just so much more that you can do with Instagram over the the the, the years, how it's changed. I, I, I sound like that old lady. <laughs> Social media when it first started. And it's just like all of the the, 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 the things that are, are available now on a platform like Instagram is incredible. So yeah, that's, that's probably the best place to find me and see what I'm, I'm, I'm doing, what I'm up to, who I'm talking to. So yeah, I would always say Instagram first. Awesome. I'll make sure I put the links to your Instagram and your social media accounts, but it's at Lady Velo. Yeah. Um, and Jules, I'd love for you just to, to give you the final words of advice. So final words of advice, final words of wisdom for women out there who want to get cycling. You know, what would you say to them? I would say to any women out there who want to get into to cycling, uh, interested in riding bikes and seeing what it's all about, Number one, it's not too late. I was 28 years old when I got back into it. And I was being told by people that I was too old at 28 to want to get into this activity, which I thought was insane. There is no age barrier on wanting to, to, to dip your toe into anything that you want to put your mind to. So absolutely go for it. I say this a lot, but do it at your own pace and work out what is comfortable and right for you. Don't feel like that you have to, you know, get supercharged and togged up into to Lycra immediately if you want to be on, on a saddle. That that didn't happen for, for, for me. Like it's only been the last few years that I've I've started to embrace 
the need to live in micro sometimes as well. So again, go at it at your own pace. Have a look at some of the cycling communities that exist out there because you will be surprised at who you will find and where you will find them. So for me, social media was like my gateway into to, to cycling and the communities that I'm part of and the family that I have developed over the 10 years that I've been doing this for. You may have local cycling clubs or local cycling initiatives, even through your local council, there may be things going on. There are a lot more resources and organizations and groups out there than when I started 10 years ago. So that's been a really positive thing to, to see. But dabble in the internet and, and see what you can find. You know, I, I remember the days of people saying to me, it's very weird you meeting up with people on, on the internet. And it's like, no, it's it's been the best thing that I've ever done. So definitely have a look at that. And just keep in mind that you do belong. Even if you, you feel like you're not seeing people that you can identify with, anyone that, that looks like you, who feels like you, we're out here. We're definitely out here. We're doing the best that we can to make our presence known. And every single voice in cycling is a voice that matters, especially if it's a voice that you are not hearing enough of as well. You have an incredible platform just by being you and being visible and being vocal. So there is a space for every single one of you out there who want to give this a go and get into this thing. And don't ever let anybody tell you that you don't belong or that you don't fit or that this isn't for you. That's rubbish. Tune out the noise and tune into the joy. Oh. What a way to finish. Love it. Jules, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. Let me say that again. <laughs> Hold on. I've got, I got a frog caught in my throat. <laughs> Jules, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more about your love and passion for cycling. It's been absolutely amazing to speak with you. Thank you kindly for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Jules. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring you and increasing the amount of female role models in the media. Everything that Jules has talked about today will be in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. And like Jules says, it is so important um, to use your voice. So you do have a voice, you do have influence. So please do go and buy Jules's book. You can buy it direct from her, from her website and get a signed copy copy, which is what I did. Absolutely awesome. The other thing that you can go and do is leave a review, write a review on Amazon. If you are reading books by incredible female authors, please take the three or four minutes to leave a review. It really does make a massive difference and it helps and encourages other people to support other women in cycling, who are writing books, who are in sports. It really does add up. So you do have power. You do have influence. Use that power. Use that influence. Support other women. Help to increase the amount of female role models in the media. We have spoken to a number of cyclists before, so I'd highly recommend that you go and take a listen to Jasmine Muller. She shares more about ultra cycling, breaking records, dealing with failure and saddle sores. Rachel Yassine, she's a 49-year-old mother and full-time adventurer who's cycling the world and living a very nomadic lifestyle on her own terms. Jenny Graham, she became the fastest woman to cycle around the world, so she cycled 18,000 miles over four continents through 16 countries, completing the trip solo and unsupported in just 124 days. So there is a whole range of incredible women, like I've said before, who have shared their stories on the Tough Girl podcast. So please do go check it out. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free. And that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting the work I do, please do go and visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. And a big thank you to Flora Jones, who've just signed up as an annual member, an annual supporter. So Flora, thank you so much. I really do appreciate all of your support. So um, yes, new episodes of Tough Girl Podcast go live Tuesday and Thursday, 7am UK time. So I'll be back with you very, very soon. Take care. Lots of love. Bye.